1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 it says, May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are made three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Now, in the first part of this teaching series last week, I, I talked a lot about the physical body. We started with the least important of the three. We're going in this order, body, soul, and spirit. And so next week I'll be wrapping up this teaching with the most important of all, talking about the spirit. But uh, the body uh, is, is very important. Your body is, is really important. It's just not as important as the soul and the spirit. And so if you missed last week's teaching, I really urge you to go online. Go to BuckeyeFirstAssembly.net. You can watch the teaching video online. And uh, I have some important things to say about the body. And I did so in that uh, message last week about the body. The body is, is very uh, important, but it's not nearly as important as the mysterious thing that I want to be talking to you about today. So last week was, go play that video, the body, and this week is the spirit. So go right ahead. This week is the soul. So last week we talked about this body and, and how uh, it has some mechanics to it and it's real and you can touch it. But this thing we're talking about today has an element of mystery to it and it, it is uh, really even more important. Did you know that you are a soul man? You are. You have a soul inside of you. That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now you may have thought that the Blues Brothers had soul, but let me tell you something. You got soul. You do. You've got soul. Um, Matthew chapter 16 is the text that I want us to look at this morning. For, for our sermon, it is verse number 24, and I'm reading verses 24 to 26. It says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any one of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Clearly, there is more to this life than just having a body. I, I think we know that, but we, we tend to forget that because this body wakes up every morning with needs. It's just like a crying baby. It just demands and it wants attention and it wants it now. You don't even have to uh, worry about it. Your body will do that for you. It will wake up saying what it wants. Our spirit man, on the other hand, is, is much more polite and not pushy. It wants to be in the background and is content to be there until you focus on it. And so the body is screaming for attention and the spirit is waiting patiently and strangely, a lot of our living happens right in the middle of that area. It takes place in the middle of the two. The, the tension between the body and the spirit, the soul, is the place where you decide which one wins. Now I want to share with you two points this morning. Number one, the first point is this. Turn from your selfish ways. 
Turn from your selfish ways. If you try to hang on to your life, Jesus used that phrase, interesting phrase. If you try to hang on to your life, you know, that strategy hasn't worked very well for the ones who have tried to hang on to their lives. Uh, depending on which study you believe, you know, conservatives say that there are around 15 billion people who have lived on planet Earth from the beginning until now. More liberal minds say, no, it's more like 110 billion. In any event, the strategy to try to hang on to your life hasn't worked very well for all of our predecessors. In fact, death so far has a batting average of 1,000. Every person who has lived has died. With the one exception, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead and lives evermore. Now, Every other single individual that's ever lived has died. Even, even the ones that were raised back to life miraculously. We read in the Bible about Lazarus being raised from the dead. We read about Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. There was an occasion where the, Elijah, uh, the prophet Elijah raised a little boy back to life. And there was the widow of Nain whose only son had died. God raised him back to life. Did you know there are actually modern miracles that happen in our time? We, Stephanie and I know of a missionary in Africa that saw someone raised back to life. But here's the thing. Even when God does amazing miracles like that, still every one of those individuals eventually died. So if you try to hang on to life and you cling to life and if you hoard life, guess what? You lose it. But when you give it away, you win. And that is the second point. The second point is give up your life. Give up your life. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't saying that he wants you to die, not in a physical sense, not giving it away in that sense, not at all. I mean, you can only do that once. But he's saying, die a little bit every day to your personal longings. And in that spirit of sacrifice, you start to learn what real living is all about. And then down in verse number 26, he places the highest priority on our souls. He says, is anything worth more than your soul? Is there anything that is more valuable than your soul? Obviously, you know, as we're talking about spirit, soul, and body, the spirit is important. And last week I made the statement that the, the spirit um, gets highest priority, but the soul is most important in this sense. The soul is where you decide if you will believe in Jesus or not. The soul is that part of you that decides if you will be saved or not. It's that part of you that decides will you connect to Jesus Christ or not. The soul is so much more important than the body. What good, Luke says it this way, what good does it do to gain the whole world and lose yourself in the process? That's how Luke worded it. Lose yourself in the process. And the reason is that the soul is the real you of you. This is a paradox and I hope you catch the irony here because Jesus says this, turn from your selfish ways, turn from your selfish ways, and if you can do that, you will find your true self, the you of you. 
So then how do you how do you define soul? What is the soul? Honestly, we can't know the difference between soul and spirit. I mean, on a human level, I don't think we can really ever truly understand the difference between soul and spirit. It, it sort of gets blurry to us. But, but, and in fact, maybe we're foolish to even try, but the Bible describes those two things differently. God is able to tell the difference between spirit and soul. The Bible says this in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. <clears throat> Divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So even though we can't understand what it's all about, you know, God, He... He's not confused. God made us. And He is not confused at all. The Word of God divides soul and spirit, it says. And so to me, the best working definition of what the soul actually is, the soul is the very seat of your emotions, your intellect, and your will. If you ever took a philosophy course, maybe a high school philosophy course or a college philosophy course. They talk about ethos, pathos, and logos. Uh, Aristotle was the one that was most famous for this teaching. He taught that ethos, and you can kind of hear the word ethics, has to do with what is right. That there's a right and a wrong, and that's ethos. Pathos, you think of the word sympathy, empathy, it's what you feel. Pathos is feelings. And then logos is word. It is reasoning. It's intellectual. It's, it means what you think about something. So maybe Aristotle didn't quite have it all right, but for the most part, he, he does seem to be in line with what the Bible teaches about uh, the spirit, soul, and body, and in particular the soul having these different dimensions. Now, Aristotle believed these three things, ethos, pathos, and logos, were all given to us so that we could persuade other people with them. It's all about persuasion. So whether you're up in front of a group talking or giving a speech, those three things are kind of your God-given gift to be able to persuade someone. And so if Johnny wants pizza for dinner, he can persuade mom, and he can use reasoning, and he can appeal to emotions, and he can put all of it together and, and get his message across. But you see, I believe that there's more to it than just persuasion. I believe that what the Bible bears out is that ethos, pathos, and logos are more than just persuasive tools, but actually it is the very fabric of your soul. The soul is the coming together of what you think and how you feel and what you choose to do. Catch this because it's, it's really an important understanding of what the soul is. The soul is the convergence of what you think and how you feel and what you will choose to do. I like to talk about it uh, this way. It's what I call the battle of intellect versus the emotions. The soul can best be described by that moment when you are seized by temptation. If you want to know what kind of soul you have, then watch how you behave when you are tempted. There is a, a moment when you experience this sensation that you are powerless, when the enemy has a hook in your soul, and you feel like you're being led astray or pulled away. It's almost like a devil-raised barb that gets wedged inside of you and hooks and begins to pull you in a direction. So you're being led astray further by temptation, drawn, pulled, and you feel no resistance. And there are times, these are the times, that cause some men to say, 
there is no such thing as free will. Uh, the, these are the, the very time of temptation is what makes someone decide, well, there is no such thing as a free will involved. I want to tell you, there's some deep theology going on in that moment. Now maybe that person is not going to pull dusty theology books off the shelf and dust them off and read B.B. Warfield or Rudolf Bultmann or, or stuff like that. But in the moment of temptation, they begin to reason and think inside their head. I was powerless. I was set up. I had no choice. I was led down the primrose path. In this temptation, yes, I sinned, but I could no more resist it than a slave could resist being put up on a training block. So the mind reasons and fills in the blanks and says, if I couldn't resist this temptation, then there is no free will. And if there's no free will, then that means there is no choice in salvation. I had no choice to resist sin. Then how can I choose to be saved or not to be saved? Therefore, God chooses the ones that He wants to be saved, and I don't have anything to do with it. That's where Reformed teaching and Calvinistic theology comes from. This very moment of temptation, which says, the best I can hope for is just that God will choose me because I'm powerless to choose Him. It's, and you see, all of this deep theology can take place inside the heart of a man without ever even using any words. Without ever even trying to articulate it. It is felt in the instant of wrestling with temptation and it's one of Satan's biggest tools. When the truth is, the truth is, if we would be honest about it, I am the one who sinned. I chose to put myself in that environment where I would be tempted. I could have chosen to do something else, but I didn't. In fact, I could have resisted, even when I felt the devil raise barb deep in my soul. But I chose not to pull it out because that would have been painful. I could have fought for all that was holy with everything inside my being, crying out to God to deliver me. But no, I chose to whimper as I was led astray, as I mumbled on the way, but I can't help myself. I can't help myself. Temptation shows the activity of the soul more than any other thing. What happens in the moment of temptation will define the level of your success as a Christian. You will either say, it's God's fault and I didn't have any choice. God, it's your fault for making me this way. Or you will say, God, forgive me for being duped by the enemy. Teach me to become more aware of my own sinfulness and my devices. You see, in the soul... And, and remember, the, the emotions are part of that. The mind, the emotions, and the will, when the emotions become involved, they can overpower the mind. And they can overpower the will. I like the teaching of Press Gillum in this regard. Press Gillum has this great teaching about the way emotions work. And... Um, he says the emotions and the mind and the will, they all play together. And Press says, let's just suppose that you were walking down the sidewalk, just minding your own business, when all of a sudden somebody put a snake in front of you. I tell you, this is the deadest crowd. <laughs> expecting somebody to jump. She didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> see, there's, there's two different things going on when you see a rubber snake. You've got the emotions and the intellect all happening at the same time. 
The emotions are involved, boy, they're full on board involved, and the, the intellect's involved. What happens is, <sighs> intellect and emotions instantly. I saw a rubber snake. <sighs> And uh, the, the intellect says, oh, there's a snake. What type of snake is it? Is it poisonous? Is it going to strike? Should I step back? Have I done anything to make the snake mad? The emotion says, oh, there's a snake. Fear. I feel fear. I'm afraid. I'm surprised. I'm excited. I'm worried. If you see a rubber snake, you jump. And then your, your intellect says, oh, it's a rubber snake. <laughs> and you can understand that intellectually in an instant, but the emotions don't work that way, do they? The emotions elevator gets stuck on the ninth floor, right? And so the intellect and the emotions go whew, And the intellect says, oh, it's just a rubber snake. But the emotions take a long time to waft back down to where they should be. It must be the way that God designs us. And so let's put that into practice in the real world. It happens every day. Man sees curvy girl. curvy girl bats eyelashes at man. <laughs> and uh, there's this moment where there's a, decisions to, a decision to be made because in an instant the emotions say she's attractive. I feel excitement. I want her. I have needs. Pathos. Those are feelings. Your intellect says, this is wrong. I'm married. She is someone's wife. She is somebody's daughter. All of this happens in an instant. Now, what do you choose? You had the feelings, that's pathos. You have the intellect, that's logos. Now you're going to choose. That's ethos. That's ethics. That's ethical. There's, there's a right and a wrong. And what will you choose to do? Don't let your feelings and your emotions dictate what you choose. You are a child of God. Your emotions may get stuck on the ninth floor, but you do what you know is right. And in time, your feelings will line up and respond when you follow what is ethical and good and what you know God is calling you to do. And, and that happens over and over in the course of life. Through any one day, you make multiple decisions. The way you buy and sell a car, the way you embellish a, a conversation about yourself to a friend, uh, whether or not you zip through the fast food place or the style of music that you listen to on the radio. You make decisions all day long, over and over. In the fall of 1985, uh, I lived, uh, actually it was in the summer of 1986. I came home from college and living with parents and I had a 1976 Chevy Camaro with a four barrel carburetor and a 350 in it. Can you say hallelujah? Yeah. Right. And that car would flat run and honestly kind of got me in trouble sometimes. And it was, it was paid for. I had paid it out over uh, 19 months, $100 a month on a loan and it was paid for. And I was starting to get a little more money. And honestly, I needed to do some repairs on the car. I was not maintaining it well. But I saw this 1975 Chevy pickup truck across the street from the church. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be awesome to have two vehicles? And the guy only wants $300. Now, it's a smoking deal. I saw myself 
tooling around town with that little Chevy Love pickup truck and telling people, yeah, I've got a Camaro back at the house. You know, I was Mr. Mr. Wise. And, and I, I went and I bought that pickup truck. Didn't even talk to my dad about it. Nothing. I mean, I just showed up in the driveway and I remember dad looking and he says, what's that? Dad bought a truck. And he just smiled and said, okay. <laughs> And that night, I got in my new Chevy Love pickup truck and I went out to, we had a wiener roast with a youth group out of town at this property out in a, a field and it was really going to be a fun event. I'm riding to the, to the wiener roast and, you know, bonfire marshmallows and all that and I'm excited and I notice it kind of chugs along every once in a while like this and boom, kind of feels like it's backfiring, you know, that's a little odd. And when I got there, a, a friend of mine said, hey, Keith, did you know there are blue flames shooting? out of the back exhaust of your pickup truck? <laughs> I'll give you the short story. Listen, it was just a matter of days till literally the valve burned out on my Camaro because I wasn't taking care of it. So now I'm stuck with the blue Chevy Love pickup truck that I nicknamed Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And, <laughs> and so literally, Dad calls up Sam Jock, who's a friend of ours, and, and he, own, he doesn't own the car lot, but he's a dealer at a car lot. And, and so we drive to Kaufman, Texas to trade them both in. Now picture this. Dad's in front of me in the Camaro, and it dies just before he gets to the driveway of the dealership. So here I'm driving along, chitty chitty bang bang, boom boom boom, flames coming out the back of my truck and pull over. I'm like, Dad, what's, what's wrong? He said, son, it died. You're going to have to help me. Let's push. We literally, we get out and push the car onto the lot. And then I get in chitty chitty bang bang and sparks flying as I pull it in, in the lot. And these guys are walking out the door just like, oh, we got a live one on our hands. I learned a valuable lesson. Don't go by feelings. Go by what you know is right. Every moment of your life you're making decisions. There's a right and there's a wrong. And this message is about getting you to understand how important decision making is to building the fabric of your lives. I want to share James chapter 1 with you. And I want you to pay attention to three different words. The word desire, the word sin, the word word. Those three words. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Those three words, desire, sin, and word, I want you to notice what they really mean. Desire is the word for feelings. It's pathos. Sin is the word for ethics, for, eth uh, for ethos. It's ethical. And then the, the last one, word, is about reasoning. And this, this is right out of Strong's Concordance. These are those three and how they work in our lives. You've got feelings. You've got intellect. You, you have got to choose in the heart of you, what's right and what you will do. Third John chapter two, uh, third John verse two, it teaches something important about the soul. It's a catalyst for determining the welfare of your entire person. It regulates how well you do. John wrote, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. Now, some false teachers, in my opinion, got a hold of this verse, and particularly the King James Version, and distorted it to say something that it did not intend to say, I would that you would prosper even as your soul prospers. And, and so some people latched a hold of that word prosper, and they said, oh, this is about prosperity. We're supposed to experience prosperity. 
But it's not talking about finances. It's just talking about prosperity of, of your soul. The main thing this verse is trying to communicate is that our soul is a catalyst, a regulator for our outlook. So as I close, how are you today? Some of you might say, tired, I'm tired. Hey, man, how are things going for you? Oh, nothing good ever happens for me. Gloom and despair and agony on me, right? You need to come to mechanic Jesus. Come into his shop. He's going to have to change out your regulator. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. There's an app for that. Each of these teachings I'm closing with a practical application for your daily life. And this is it. Ask the Holy Spirit to engage your thoughts, your feelings, and your will in personal decision making. Did you know that He will do that? The Holy Spirit loves to do that. He will help you. He will help you in your daily decision making to choose the right way. Um, you know, you really, you really are a soul man. It's part of tripartite. You are spirit, soul, and body. You're a remarkable design by our Father in heaven. Don't, don't waste it. So as our worship team comes back up, I... I want to lead us in a prayer for our thoughts to match what our spirits know to be true. I would like to ask you the most important question that anyone could ever ask you. Is there anything more valuable than your soul? Can you think of anything that's more valuable than your soul. Have you asked Jesus to save your soul? You know, we, we can tend to think, well, you know, I'm a good person and, and I go to church and, and I'm the sort of person that I would do anything for anybody. If someone needs help, they can trust me, they can count on me. And I, I would just imagine that, that God's going to let me into heaven because I am, I'm a good person. I'm not a mean person like others out there that I've known of. But here's the deal. The only way that I can make it into heaven is to say, God, Forgive my sins. Save my soul. Jesus, I believe you. I believe that you died on the cross. And I believe that you rose again. And I believe that you're coming back. So I, I repent. I repent for all of my wrongs. I just put my sins underneath your blood covering. And I plan to follow you all of my days. That's the only way to make heaven your home. Is there anything more valuable than your soul? I want to pray right now a prayer that would help individuals to ask Jesus to come and live inside of your heart. Father, I thank you for the ones who this morning are asking you to be their master. I pray that you would make it easy for them. The individuals that are saying, Dear Lord Jesus, save my soul. Rescue me. If that's you, then just pray like this. Say, Lord God, forgive my sins. Give me a new start today. I turn away from my old way of living. 
I turn away from it. I repent. I'm going to live for you from now on. And I know I'm not perfect, but I, I do expect to grow. And I thank you for giving me friends around me to help me on my journey. Forgive my sins. Rescue me and save me. Save my soul. Save all of me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, and if you really did mean that in your heart, I promise you, Jesus is your Savior. He's living in you right now. I want to help you get a good start. You received when you came in a, a card that has, it has a connect card on there. And if you just ask Jesus to save you this morning, check that box and 